We continue our study in the parables of the kingdom. We are in Matthew chapter 13, and when we stopped, we made it up to verse 44. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. <clears throat> Matthew 13, beginning at verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. And then he said to them, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, it is at your command that as we gather together in your presence that we read aloud your word. Lord, we recognize that the book of Psalms is your word, and the book of Matthew is your word, and other places that we will be searching in your scriptures today is your word. You gave this word. You have preserved this word. You are present by your Holy Spirit to teach us your word, and we ask that you would. We really need your revelation. Holy Spirit, we're counting on you for revelation, especially when we study parables. So, Lord... Let us know what's on your heart, and then show us the proper response. How do we put into practice what you teach us this day? It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, there are seven kingdoms, and I mean seven parables in these um, parables of the kingdom of heaven. We have been through four of them. And so we've got the last three that are clustered together. Do you remember the first four Jesus teaches outside uh, to a very large crowd uh, to the point he has to get in a boat, remember, and get offshore so that they can hear him. There's just so many people. But then he goes inside the house and he's just with his immediate disciples. Uh, he explains a few of the parables, but then he teaches a few others without explanation. And so the first four, we've had pretty clear revelation, explanation as to what they are, and we're through with those. Uh, but now we get to three that Jesus just speaks, but he doesn't explain. He expects us to dig a little bit in Scripture. Uh, after he goes through these three, he asks them, do you understand these? Oh, yeah. And I'm sure it's kind of like, yes, well, I think so, I, I guess, I hope so, you know, so he doesn't go any further on some of these parables. Now, there are many parables that are listed in Scripture uh, that Jesus teaches. They're very common in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't use them. You remember the Holy Spirit spoke to John uh, decades later about writing his gospel rather than the others. So there's a little different emphasis in John, and he kind of ties up all these loose ends so you don't have the uh, parables included there, but we've got them in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Remember, Jesus did not teach in parables the first year of his ministry, only after he had been rejected by the religious leadership, and that they, the religious leadership uh, told people, don't listen to Jesus of Nazareth. He's not the one we're waiting for. And yet Jesus continued to minister, and they continued to embrace him, and he continues to do so today. So he, he, he didn't 
didn't stop teaching the other way. He still did very directly, but he added parables. And many of those parables are good for every generation. That's why we have them today. It says they use many other parables, which are not written down, but those that are Jesus speaking in every generation, those are Jesus speaking in this room at this moment directly to your heart. We have those. In other words, God speaking to his people in every generation, in every language, in every location, that is the ones that we still study. So we're going to need God's help. We can review a little bit. Remember what we've been taught so far is that God's very active on this earth. Uh, God is just like a farmer who's planting seed, but the seed that he plants is his word. And every single day, God plants his word in the human heart. Every single day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, from generation to generation, God is active. He desires to be known. He is revealing himself. He is planting his word, his good word, in human hearts all over this earth. There are four conditions of the human heart. We discovered only one that will bring forth a crop that is eternal, that is everlasting. And so we discover that what the condition of our heart is the most important thing that we bring to this point today. That's what pleases the Lord. That's what God's looking at, my heart right now, your heart right now. If our heart is open and honest and fertile and seeking and we want God to do a work, God will. If you're willing to know God's will, you will know God's will. And if you're willing to put it into practice, he will empower you by his Holy Spirit. He delights in that. He loves to grow us up, to mold and shape us through his word. So this is happening at this very moment, and it happens every single time we gather together. If you have private Bible study, public Bible study, whatever, any time God is planting his word, he is present to mold and shape us. It's the condition of our hearts that will determine what kind of crop comes forth. Second parable reminds us that God plants his people. And he plants his people in the field, of it says, of this world. In other words, throughout humanity. Throughout humanity, God plants the redeemed. He strategically does that. He can move us around as he sees fit. He's the one who has assigned us a ministry. He's the one who's equipped us with spiritual gifts. And so he is the one who has given us an assignment. You are here for a reason. There's something you're supposed to do. There's something you can do every day that will bring a smile to God's face and will make a difference a thousand years from now, 10,000 years from now, for eternity. Because God's word lasts forever. And that which we do because we love the Lord at the prompting of the Spirit of God, plan God's Word, you know, literally planting God's Word in other people's lives, God watches over literally forever. Your life can have a much greater impact, not just a year, not just 10 years, not 100 years. You can actually touch souls forever. Such is the power of the Word of God. So the second uh, parable that we studied was that God's the one who plants His people in among mankind. At the same time, the devil plants his counterfeits so that there can be a, there, there is a battle that is going on for souls. Uh, Jesus let us know that uh, in a third parable that this kingdom would grow very big. Now the church is supposed to be kind of like lowly mustard, biting and, and very sharp and a little bit flavors a lot and a little bit goes a long way. But it says something is going to happen in this kingdom of heaven that it is, this is going to grow. It's going to be like a, a kingdom of men and that's going to cause a lot of confusion that the enemy can actually come and camp in the branches. Do you remember as we studied what those birds were all about. Uh, just as the kingdom of Assyria is referred to as a tree and the kingdom of Babylon and the various kingdoms of men. It shows, so something's going to, to go wrong that there's going to be this counterfeit and that among that which is called the kingdom of heaven you will actually find the works of the enemy. You will actually find confusion. You will actually find some who claim to be uh, throughout history of God and yet they persecute the righteous. Sometimes it's been religious persecution of those who are born again in Jesus, those who love the Lord, uh, those who had to come out from among them. And, and Jesus told us before it ever happened. Well, we get to this, these, these last three here, and we're going to have to do a little homework. 
the, the, the last two will go a little faster than the first one. So please bear with me. Let's look at this again. Matthew 13, uh, 44, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. We've already been taught each time we have a man, we've got Jesus there. We've got God. We've got the Lord who is the one who is doing the action. There's no need to change our interpretation from one parable to the next. So that's where Jesus is in this parable. The field has already been explained to us. The field, every time it's been interpreted, has been mankind. It's been humanity. All the people on the face of the earth. That's this field. So here you have Jesus coming and discovering a treasure that is found within mankind, and he exposes it, but then he hides it, and then he sells all that he has so that he is the rightful owner of it. What in the world is that? And what am I supposed to do with that? What, what am I, how, how can I put that into practice? I, I need uh, a little more revelation. So what is this treasure that is hidden? Is there anything in Scripture that Jesus refers to as his treasure? And I will tell you that this has to do with Israel. And that something that is found in Israel, that was exposed in Israel, that has now been hid in Israel, but will be uh, revealed again. And let me show you where that comes from. Back in the book of Exodus, and I'm just going to have to bounce through some scriptures. You're welcome to jot them down. We'll just have to kind of move from one to the next. But back in Exodus chapter 19, we have uh, this, this teaching. Uh, it's going to be found, well, let's, let's start it at verse 3. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. We're going to have uh, Moses going up to, to God. It says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So we have God sharing his heart and making a declaration uh, to Moses, uh, to the people. And God says, this nation, which I have now brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand, a nation that is born in a day, will be a special treasure unto me. It will be a special treasure not only from, from generation to generation, but literally for all of time. And God's desire was that every man, woman, and child in Israel would be a priest unto him. And as a whole, they would be a holy nation. Now, you know, they failed miserably when it came time to keep their promises. And I'll just tell you that only the nation, uh, only the tribe of Levi got to be priests. But originally, what God had shared with Moses was, I want everyone, and there's going to be something unique about this nation. Every man, woman, and child can be a priest unto me. And it could be a holy nation, a nation that is separated for a specific purpose, for the delight of my heart. And God called Israel not because they were greatest, but because they were the least. Not because they were the best, but because they very often were the worst. In so many of the illustrations, God reminded them that it was God's sovereign choice, that he wanted to do a work in Israel, so that through Israel, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And this was a promise that he made when he gave them in covenant. Now the Messiah comes through Israel. 
and that is Jesus. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the one who was born of a virgin, who lived a perfect life, who never sinned in thought, word, or deed. Jesus is the one who died in the place of the sinner on the cross. Jesus is the one who paid the price for all of mankind's sin on the cross. And so the one to forgive sins is Jesus. And in Jesus, all nations of the earth can be blessed. Now there are many blessings that God desires to pour out to all the nations of the earth through Israel. We have the manifestation of Jesus being the Savior and paying the price for sins, and we're experiencing that. But there is more that God would desire to do through Israel than has been accomplished, and that which has already been secured in Jesus, but it has not yet been made manifest. So you have, starting at this point, God using the terminology that, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. It doesn't mean that uh, Jesus loved the nation of Israel more than other nations. It doesn't mean that they were going to have it better than other nations. This special treasure was what God desired to do was to have this living, this living proof of what could happen in a nation if they were in covenant with holy God. And so he declared his heart and he made his promises and he waited to see how Israel would respond. And in this, they would be that special treasure. That's the terminology. If we continue on, if we go into the book of Psalms, and I'm going to turn to Psalms 135. In Psalms 135, I'll begin reading at verse 1. It says, Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. For, God, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself and Israel for his special treasure. God continually uses this terminology for Israel, that they are his special treasure. And I'll tell you that this parable draws our attention to this special treasure, to Israel. And that there is something that Jesus uh, dug up when he came, revealed for a moment, it's buried again, but it is not yet finished. God is not finished with the nation of Israel. What is it in Israel that would be so precious to everybody? What literally could, could, could Israel do? You know, there have, there have been certain times when Israel uh, had glimpses of what could happen in a nation if they were in covenant, if they lived in covenant with God. And we'll, we'll see in every generation there was God extending this desire. And every generation seemed to struggle and have problems with it. When you come after the time of the judges and you come into the time of the kings and we start with Saul and there is a, a nation that's about to be uh, uh, recognized by their neighbors and then we go to King David who establishes this kingdom but he does so by conquest. He has to fight. You have to get rid of the enemy. You have to scatter them. You have to take the territory. You have to bind the people together. And This was the call on David's life. Uh, he was a warrior. He had shed blood. When he wanted to build the temple of God, God would not allow him to do so because he was a man of war, uh, because there was blood on his hands. He said, you can dream it, you can plan it, you can collect items for it, but I am going to appoint your son, Solomon, to be the one to build the temple because he's going to rule by covenant. He's not going to have to rule by conquest. He's not going to have to rule by the sword. He's going to be able to rule by the words of his mouth. And nations will desire to come into covenant with him, and they will accept his authority. 
And so as we go from the time of David into the time of King Solomon, we have this expansion of the territory of Israel. That which had been promised unto Abraham generations previous was a very large territory from the river of Egypt all the way to the river Euphrates, from the Mediterranean, and then all the way down to the desert, into what we would call Saudi Arabia. He says this is what God showed Abraham was the desire of God's heart would be the territory for Israel. The only king who got to rule over that much territory for a short period of time was Solomon. And he did so by covenant. And it was an unbelievable time. Uh, because David left the nation in good spiritual condition, and David was, was a, a man after God's own heart. Uh, he, was, he had a, such a wonderful relationship with the Lord. He was not a perfect man. His sins are openly recorded, but he was a very honest man before God. And when he was punished, he owned up to what he had done wrong. And he admitted that God was right. And he continued to ask for God's mercy and guidance. David was a prophet. Uh, David was given many words from the Lord, prophetic words from the Lord. He was also given many words of encouragement for his people. Many of them were given in song form, and we still have them in the book of Psalms. They can be sung unto the Lord. And what's great about a song, even somebody who cannot read can learn a song. You sing it in their presence, they'll learn it. Children who can't read, learn songs. And we use that all the time in the, like Sunday school and vacation Bible school and all. They can't read yet, but we can, boy, they can learn those songs and they can learn those names and they can learn those books of the Bible having not even been able to read. Such is the power of song when you put God's word to a song. So David left at age 70, he dies, but he, he leaves the next administration in a good place to build upon. And Solomon starts off with a very humble heart. Remember Solomon, when, when God speaks to Solomon, Solomon, uh, you know, it, God tells him, I'll give you whatever you want. What do you ask of me? And he asks for wisdom. He says, I, 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 I'm, I'm too young. I can't handle this. Now he's 30 years old and he co-reigned with his dad the last 18 months of his dad's life, but he says, I'm too young to handle this. This is a great people. This is a great calling. And he says, I need wisdom. You know, would you, would you give me wisdom to be able to, to rule your people correctly? And God was very pleased, so he over-answered his prayer. Uh, he, he not only gave him wisdom, but he went ahead and he gave him the riches, and he gave him the power, and he gave him, he blessed him mightily. And so Solomon, for a little bit, about the first half of his reign, the first 20 years, there were unbelievable things going on in Israel. And it was not by might, it was not by conquest, it was not by the sword, it was by covenant, it was by the word of God being put into practice. And representatives from nations that had heard about that would come to Israel to look. And many entered into covenants and paid him tribute, tons of gold every year in tribute. He said, would you rule over us? We want to be included in your kingdom. We want to be a part of what God's doing in Israel in this generation. It was, an, it was just unbelievable. And let me show you uh, a little bit of that. In 1 Kings chapter 10, we, we have uh, this declaration of where the Queen of Sheba comes. And so from uh, being in, in the northern portion of, of Africa there and being in the area of Ethiopia and all that area, we have the, the Queen of Sheba, who was mighty in her own right and ruled quite a kingdom, she st kept hearing what everybody was saying, and she decided to go on her own. And God records this. And so as a nation, there was a large delegation that went with their queen to find out what in the world is going on in Israel. And what is happening? What is God doing in Israel? I mean, can this be true, what we are hearing about this king called Solomon and what's happening in this nation? How by peace they are ruling. How by covenant they are ruling. They are not ruling by conquest. 
conquest. And they are prospering. The people are happy. They are healthy. Uh, there's, how has this, how can it be? How can you go from one administration that had to rule by the sword to this next thing? So there is this little glimpse of what can happen in a nation that's in covenant where God is moving on a national level. Not just a family level, not just a local level, but God is moving on a national level. 1 Kings chapter 10, it says this, now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all her questions and there was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. In other words, he, he, he showed where he went and how he worshipped uh, the Lord. She was astonished. Verse 6, Then she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your word in your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men, and happy are these your servants, who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God, who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold, it's about four and a half tons, spices in great quantity and precious stones. There never again came such abundance of spices as the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Also the ships of Iram, which were brought gold from Ophir, brought great quantities of almug wood and precious stones from Ophir. And the king made steps of the almug wood for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, also harps and stringed instruments for singers, there never again came such almug wood, nor was the like been seen to this day. Now King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all she desired, whatever she asked, besides what Solomon had given her according to the royal generosity. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Verse 14, the weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. That's 25 tons. Neighboring nations paid him tribute of 25 tons of gold to say, we want to be a part of what's going on in Israel. We want to be with you. We don't want to fight you. We want to cooperate with you. We are willing for you to have the final say-so. He ruled by covenant. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And so what Abraham was shown, the distance that was there, Solomon's the only one for a very short period of time who got to rule over that. Uh, it talks about other things that came, and we won't, we won't get into it. We just, for a little bit, there was a glimpse. There was just this start. What does it look like for a nation that's in covenant with God? What, what does that look like? How does that affect the people? How does it affect the relationship with their neighbors? You know, how does, it, does that take place for a little bit? And, of course, that all comes, it falls apart in the second half of Solomon's reign. Those second half of 20 years, and what happened was he married a lot of women who, who worship false gods. And it says as he grew older, that, that his heart began to turn toward those false gods. Idolatry was being introduced. Now, okay, no longer was in covenant with the one true God, but tried to, to please many gods. Well, you, uh, you cannot serve two masters. You have to turn your back on the first before you can embrace the other. You, you may not understand the spiritual deception, but that's what happened. That's what took place. So he ends up with 700 wives and 300 girlfriends many of them were in were, were 
uh, into idol worship. He actually built temples unto other idols. It destroyed the nation. The nation fell into civil war upon his death and has not been reunited to this day. But there was a glimpse. There was a moment. There was about a 20-year period in there that when you and I read in Scripture, it is unbelievable what took place in this special treasure. What does it look like when a nation concentrates in a covenant relationship with holy God? And, and see, it, they were, where there was peace with their neighbors when they brought in the idolatry, now came the competition, the jealousy, the envy, and of course then there were tax, and of course they, they were destroyed from within. There was rebellion, there was civil war that took place when he died. Israel is supposed to be a working model of what God would desire to do in every nation. But you know, there came judgment, and God said, if you do not keep this covenant, if you insist in entering into covenants with idols, you are going to pay a price as a nation. Now, God had promised Abraham that Israel would always remain. And God never breaks his promises. You know, Jesus comes. Where of all the places does Jesus come? Jesus doesn't show up in Brazil. Jesus doesn't show up in Australia. Jesus doesn't show up in Canada. Of all the places, of all the places, Jesus shows up in Israel. He shows up exactly where he's supposed to. He is born of a virgin in Bethlehem. He is Jewish. Because God says the nation of Israel is that special treasure unto him that has has not changed though they have been they have experienced judgment though they have been scattered among the nations God prophesied that he would call them back unto himself you know Jesus came and had he been embraced by the nation of Israel we could have ushered in what we refer to as the millennium right then in other words had his nation embraced him entered into covenant with him then that which had been promised could be established on the earth. But his nation rejected him. As a whole, the civil government and the religious leadership rejected him. There was a remnant. For a moment, he came and he revealed what was going on. You know, if, if so many people pray for world peace, so many people want world peace. So many people, you know, and there's contests, and what would you like to see? I would like world peace. Sometimes it's mocked. But there is a desire in people's heart to get along with others. Can't we get along? Isn't there some way that we can live in peace? Couldn't one nation live at peace with another nation? Couldn't one group of nations live at peace with another nation? Is there any way that that can happen? And from generation to generation, men have been looking for their solutions. Some come to the conclusion, well, they can live at peace when I'm in charge. So we'll get everybody and we'll all do it my way and then we're just going to keep going. And of course, when that dictator dies, then you have a change that takes place. Is there any way for there to be peace among the nations? Is there any way that that could happen? Is it any way prophesied that that could take place in Scripture? And I'll tell you that the only way that that can happen and the only time frame that that's mentioned in Scripture is when the nation of Israel embraces Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah. That there will come a time that the nation of Israel back in their land and see they're back in their land now. See, Jesus was received by a remnant he is that King of Kings. He is that Lord of Lords. He is the rightful Messiah, but he was rejected. For a little bit, there was the hope. He came doing good. He did good deeds. He didn't do evil. He didn't do harmful things. He did good. He, he is the one who forgave sins. He's the one who healed bodies. He's the one who raised the dead. He's the one who set people free from demons. He's the one who turned the heart of the parent to the child and the child to the parent. He's the one who turned the heart of the husband to the wife and the wife to the husband. 
He is the King of peace. He is Jehovah Shalom. He is the only one who can bring peace to individuals and peace to families and peace to a nation and peace among nations. Because he says, until that happens, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And nation shall rise against nation. And kingdom shall rise against kingdom. And he says, it's going to be that way right until he returns. And what will bring his return is the nation of Israel must embrace him as their Messiah. Their rejection... God used to bring salvation to the Gentiles. You see, salvation is of the Jews. The prophets are of the Jews. The scripture is of the Jews. Our Savior is Jewish. And he came. And his ministry is always to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. But right now, as a nation, it says they're spiritually blinded. There's just a remnant that comes from generation to generation. But the prophecy is that Jesus will be embraced by the nation of Israel. This special treasure, what does it look like when a nation is in covenant with holy God and then that spreads to other nations? The prophecy is, is that Jesus will come and rule and reign out of Jerusalem and that the nations that have gone through a very difficult time a cataclysmic time of judgment and that there is a fresh start on this earth with Christ ruling and reigning that those nations will flow into Jerusalem they will come for worship they will come for uh, encouragement they will come for guidance and direction that special treasure of world peace can only be found when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning it is a desire in men's heart. Men's have, men have longed for it. We've tried in our generations, the last few generations, the League of Nations and the United Nations, and we want to have peace, and we set up standards, and people say, how in this time frame? People look at me, you know, they go, how in this day and age can we have these wars breaking out? Because Jesus said that's the way it's going to be. Human nature remains constant. Sin and the hardness of men's hearts remains constant. And so there is not peace within a family, and there's not peace within the neighborhood, and there's not peace within a nation or nation from nation. There is wars and rumors of wars and nation does fight against nation and kingdom against kingdom and it will be that way until Christ comes. Now we are taught that the nation of Israel will embrace a counterfeit Christ for a very short period of time longing for this key to world peace and he will rise as a man of peace and he says I've got the solution and I can bring peace among all these nations and he will for a very short period of time and then it's all going to break loose but the real thing is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ there is a in the book of Romans when we get to uh, chapters 9 10 and 11 there is this this deep teaching thinking about the power of Jesus Christ and his relationship to Israel and his relationship to the church now if you have a Jewish background if you have a Gentile background the only way to be saved is you must be born again <laughs> you must repent of your sins and give your life to Christ there's not one way for Israel to be saved and a different way for Gentiles you you must be born again doesn't matter if you have a Jewish background or you have a Gentile background you must repent of your sins and commit your life to Christ you know Jesus is the one who on the cross literally Paid, uh, he gave everything. You know, he gave everything. And you and I like to relate it to salvation. Because it does apply. On the cross, Jesus paid the price for the sin of all mankind. All sins, from Adam to the last human being, whoever that's going to be. On the cross, Jesus paid the price for all of mankind's sins. So that, is, that the way is wide open for sinners to come into the presence of holy God. Wide open! If you'll repent of your sin and come, and whomsoever may come. But much more took place there. You know, the reestablishment of the, the kingdom uh, in God's creation. You know, right now, sin is loose in creation. 
But God is going to change that. Right now, sin, is, sin and death are throughout creation. But it's going to stop. Jesus paid that price on the cross. The peace among nations... Jesus paid that price on the cross. We love because we can experience immediately what it is to be born again in Christ right away. That's something that applies to every generation. But there's more, the Bible says, that happened on that cross than just that. Sometimes we limit it. And there's a little glimpse of that when we study these teachings in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And we're just going to break in for just a little bit. In Romans chapter 11... And I'm going to pick it up at verse 11. And I know that's tough because it's right in the middle of a deep teaching. Because they wanted to know, what, what is God? Does God still have a purpose for Israel? Yes, He does. You know, He came, He drew attention to, to Israel. That treasure in the field was exposed. He found it, and then it was buried again. He paid the price for it. He owns, you know, do you understand, according to Ezekiel, He owns all the souls. You may not believe in Jesus, but even if you don't, when you die, your soul's going to report into Jesus because he's the righteous judge. He's ransomed all souls. That doesn't mean everybody's saved, but everybody's going to have to report into Jesus. There is accountability. There is a righteous judge. There is somebody who's in charge of this universe. In Romans chapter 11, verse 11, it says this, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? In other words, is God through with Israel? Is what the question is God through with Israel and it says no God still has a purpose in Israel there is still a purpose certainly not but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy salvation has come to the Gentiles now if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles how much more their fullness if in rejecting Christ as a nation the Word of God goes out to Gentiles around the earth What's going to happen when they embrace Jesus? If their rejection means the salvation of millions from generation to generation, what is going to happen when their obedience, and when as a nation, they embrace Christ? Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are who are my flesh and save some of them for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world what will their acceptance be but life from the dead in other words there there is going to be a mighty move of God when the nation of Israel embraces Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah. And that is prophesied. That's still out there. When people talk about world peace, they say, can we ever have world peace? And you say, the Bible promises we can have world peace when the nation of Israel embraces Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah. And nothing else will bring it. Nothing else. It's the special treasure. It, it is that which God says, I long to do a work in Israel so that through Israel all nations of the earth will be blessed. The devil hates that. That's why he's continually tried to destroy Israel. If he could destroy Israel, then there would be no Messiah. If he could destroy Israel, there'd be no kingdom of God with there. There'd be no established kingdom, no ruling of Christ for a thousand years on this earth. But there's a whole lot of Bible that teaches us about the rule and reign of Christ. You would have to tear out many pages and you'd have to skip over many portions of Scripture if you did not study the rule and the reign of Christ. Jesus is coming. There are some tough times prophesied first, but the end result is Christ coming, ruling and reigning. Christ victorious, the enemy defeated. Commit your life to Christ. Walk with Him in victory now. I don't know all the details, how everything's going to be worked out, but you start with Jesus, you stick with Jesus, you're going to end up with Jesus. It's a little parable, but there's an awful lot in that treasure which He revealed and He hid. He paid the price for it. He owns all of mankind. Now He's paid the price for, all, for the whole field. And He says, I'm going to reveal this again. 
Now, where the treasure specifically is linked to Israel, I'll tell you that the pearl, which we study tonight, is specifically linked to the church. Very similar, both a price to be paid, but they're not the same. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that nothing is too hard for you. We thank you that you do all things well. And that having made a promise, you will always keep it. Lord, again and again, you make a way where there is no way. This is astonishing to us. And we pause and we say thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, there are some here who need peace with you. You're the one who gives it. You're the one who forgives sins. You're the one who causes us to be born again. You're the one who gives us new life. Father, we appreciate peace personally with you. We appreciate it when you extend it to our family. We are astonished that you promise it on a worldwide basis only after you come and rule and reign. Men cannot do it. Only you can do it. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.